Okay, we must uh, pick up this session. Uh, okay, uh, chair by Simon and John. Uh, the title KK is wrong because of the title. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the talk I'm giving today is about some different issues uh, surrounding this principle called KK. Um, and the KK principle says that if you know something, like if you know you have hands, then you know that you know it. And, uh, and so uh, I basically have three goals in this talk. Um, so the, I'm going to do three things. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, so a lot of the talk is going to be about some kind of core uh, philosophical concepts in pragmatics. And uh, one of the key concepts I'm going to talk about is common ground. And so the idea there is a lot of theories of communication in pragmatics have relied on a notion of information being public. And the idea is that the felicity of various speech acts and our understanding of, uh, some, of presupposition and various effects involve this concept of some information is public and some information is not public. And I'm going to kind of review some reasons to think that uh, this notion of public information or what's common ground uh, kind of requires the truth of the KK principle. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give you a new argument that the KK principle is false. There's lots of arguments that principles like KK are false. I'm going to give you a new one. But the, the, the new argument I'm giving, that's just one brick in the wall uh, against KK. And then for me, what I think the upshot of these kinds of problems is, is I don't believe that the idea of public information is actually very helpful or important to giving a theory of communication. And that's the big kind of, if I, if I, if there was one thing you'd take away from this talk, it's to, you know, to encourage people to think more carefully about how much do we really need an idea of public information when we make sense of communication. So the way I think of communication, which I think the last talk today is about Grice, and I think of communication more in this kind of Grice tradition where when we're communicating, I'm the speaker and you're the hearer, I have my beliefs, you have your beliefs, I am trying to change your beliefs based on my beliefs. And we don't really need a notion of what information is public or like common between us. It's just, no, you have your individual beliefs, I have my individual beliefs, we're playing a game that involves manipulating those things. That's how I like to think about communication as much as possible. And I'm kind of interested in exploring how far can you make sense of everything, just doing that and not using the idea of public information. And that's kind of like the big picture of what I'm gonna talk about today. Okay, so first I'm going to review why why do we think why do we think that public information or common ground is important, um, and so I think uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more applications uh, in the Q and A. But here are two applications that I've worried about a bit. Um, one is kind of outlining the basic rules for speech acts like assertion and asking questions. So the idea is well. You should only assert uh, that it's raining or ask whether it's raining if it's not already common ground or publicly known or you know publicly announced that uh, that it's raining. So if, if it's already public information that it's raining, it would be weird or redundant uh, to assert that it's raining, and it'd be strange to ask whether it's raining. So the idea is, you know, that public information explains the the felicity conditions for uh, speech acts. So that's that's one application, and then a second application is in the theory of presupposition. Uh, and here the idea is if P presupposes Q, you should only assert P if Q is common ground or public information. And that's kind of like one of the fundamental, like if you want to get a grip on what, what this, you know, pub presupposition is a technical term, but that's, you know, one way of thinking about what does it mean? So, so the sentence, Alice stopped smoking presupposes that Alice used to smoke. And one of the things that's supposed to mean is, okay, you should only assert that Alice stopped smoking if it's already common ground that Alice used to smoke. Uh, and then ultimately, what I want to do is see as far as possible, how can we instead make sense of, you know, felicity of speech acts and presupposition without appealing to common ground and appealing to other things instead. Uh, I want to kind of see how far can we go with that. And then the reason for that is I think the idea of common ground is going to be, it would only make sense. Uh, it could only exist. Uh, th the idea of there being things that are common ground between us could only happen if KK were true. That, that knowledge iterated freely, but KK is not true. And so we it doesn't work. That's going to be kind of the structure for today. But but more generally, there are other reasons besides from what I'm going to say today of why I'm skeptical of common grounds. So it's just one brick in the wall against common ground. Um, okay, so what is common ground? What's public information? 
Uh, well, okay, one thing I think is very important is if you're giving a theory of what common ground is, it's very important that you reduce the notion of public information to in some way or other to the mental states of the participants of the conversation you're in. It doesn't have to be any particular mental state, but I'm just saying like it shouldn't be like a primitive thing, like whatever it is, it should be built out of the, you know, the people in the conversation, because otherwise it's not going to have much to do with people who are talking to each other. And what are the candidates? Well, there's different mental states that it could involve. It could involve knowledge, it could involve belief. Some people have thought it involves this other thing, acceptance, which in my opinion, I would just call that pretending to believe, you know, but other people use it in other ways. And you could have pretending to know, you know. And then here's some examples. And by the way, throughout this talk, I'm gonna focus on knowledge, but I think all the same kinds of points can be made with belief and acceptance. It's just don't have time for that. Uh, but in particular, the argument I'm going to give against KK, if you know, then you know that you know. I think there's similar things you can say against BB, which is if you believe, then you believe you believe. So one theory of common ground that is a simple theory, but I, I don't think people really like it, is, uh, is shared knowledge. Shared knowledge is just when everyone knows something. So this would be a simple theory of common ground. You know, So it would be common ground that Alex used to smoke if everyone in this room uh, knows that Alex used to smoke. That's shared knowledge. But the problem is, it seems like shared knowledge can't play all the roles that common ground is supposed to play. And here's an example. So imagine we all know that Alex used to smoke, but now imagine I'm 99% confident that uh, we don't know that Alex used to smoke. So we do have shared knowledge that Alex used to smoke, but I think we don't have that. And now imagine I assert Alex stopped smoking, seems like that would be a very strange thing for me to do. And because Alex stops smoking presupposes that Alex used to smoke. And it seems like the reason it's strange has something to do with, I haven't satisfied the requirements that it needs to be common ground that Alex used to smoke. And it's not common ground because even though we all know it, we don't know that we all know it. And then, you know, a more complicated theory would be, well, it's common ground if everyone in the conversation knows that everyone knows that piece. So that would be like shared to knowledge. To knowledge is when you know that you know, two iterations. And then I actually kind of like this theory, honestly, um, but uh, there are reasons to think it won't work, you know, in similar ways. Um, so now imagine we all know that Alex used to smoke and we all know that we all know that Alex used to smoke but I'm 99% uh, confident that we don't satisfy that condition. So in particular, mention I'm 99% confident that we are in the previous story. So the previous story we knew, but we didn't know that we knew. And now I'm saying, imagine, no, imagine we do know that we know, but I'm 99% confident I, I'm in this situation. Well, in this situation, I shouldn't assert that Alex stopped smoking. So I'm 99% confident I'm in a situation where I shouldn't assert that Alex stopped smoking. So it seems similarly weird to assert that Alex stopped smoking. I think that something like this, maybe I butchered execution, but I think something like this is the re is vignettes kind of like this are why people think shared to knowledge is also not enough to be common ground. And so then that leads to the the standard definition of common ground, um, well, sorry, the standard thing is, is not using knowledge, but just using the, the logical structure applied to some attitude, whether it's belief or pretending to believe. But common ground is having common knowledge that P, which means everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows uh, that P for every iteration of knowledge, um, the group knows that the group knows um, that many iterations, you know? Um, and the idea is this avoids the previous challenges because you can't have a situation where, where if you have common knowledge that P, you can't doubt whether you have common knowledge that P, you can't be unsure because you, you know that you have common knowledge that P, because that's the definition, because you have every iteration. So, you, well, assuming some stuff about infinite, I don't like any of it. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's a theory of common ground. You can say it's common knowledge, but now the problem is that I think, and not just me, you know, there's, 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 there's various people who thought you could only have common knowledge if something like the KK principle were true. And that's not an appropriate theory of knowledge or, or analogously for belief, common belief. So we should reject. So, so the, the basic structure is gonna be, well, but common knowledge is impossible. So the most promising theory of common ground is gonna be a state that we can't have. And why is that? Well, basically it's because well, here's why. So there's another thing, omega knowledge. Um, it's different than common knowledge. That's just an individual person. So I omega know that I have hands would mean I know I have hands. 
I know that I know I have hands. I know that I know that I know I have hands. I have every iteration of knowledge that I have hands. Now, common knowledge of, for a group requires omega knowledge, you know, because we know that we know. Well, that that implies that I know that I know, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and so common knowledge implies uh, having uh, omega knowledge. But then, basically, you know, there's there's a lot of work in philosophy. Uh, 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 suggest arguing that omega knowledge is actually not, uh, that's not a state, you, you don't omega know pretty much anything. Maybe you omega know you exist, but you don't omega know you have hands. And analogously, you don't omega believe anything. This is somewhat different arguments, but you know, this is similar dialectic. So, you know, there's reasons to think, and why is that? Well, the basic picture is knowing that you have hands is easier than knowing you know you have hands. In order to know you know, well, knowledge requires things like having evidence, and that your beliefs are reliable. And to, to know that you know something, you need even more evidence than just to know it. You know, and, and to know that you know, you, you have to be more reliable than just to know. So if you have that kind of picture, well, a simplistic version of that picture, which, you know, you could get into details, would then say, well, to have infinite iterations of knowledge, that would take infinite amounts of difficulty and reliability. I'm sure a room full of logicians could imagine ways out of that kind of argument and with various uh, mathematical structures that are interesting to think about, but that's the big picture, you know, structure. So anyways, that's why, so that's a, that's a challenge that some people worry that uh, omega knowledge is, a, we don't omega know things and so therefore we don't have common knowledge because omega knowledge would require infinitely uh, power, in, in, infinitely infinite powers of discriminate of perceptual discrimination and that's not something that uh, agents who communicate have but then there's a different theory of knowledge which is this kk theory and that would allow uh, omega knowledge and would allow common knowledge and on this view no having two iterations of knowledge is no harder than having one iteration of knowledge because it's just the same at the moment you know you omega know if you know that you have hands then you know that you know you have hands now that doesn't quite get you to common knowledge because common knowledge is a different structure. It's we know that we know. So, so that we can try to build it up though. So it's like, it's you and me having a conversation and imagine I know uh, that Alex used to smoke and you know that Alex used to smoke. It follows that I Omega know that Alex used to smoke and, and you Omega know that Alex used to smoke. But then you can imagine people who work on this, uh, like Dan Greco, he imagines like these symmetry assumptions where imagine I know you're exactly like me. So I know that you know everything I know. I know that you know P if and only if I know P. Well, then if I know that I omega know, then I know that you omega know. And that kind of assumption plus KK can get you that we have common knowledge, assuming we have shared knowledge. So that's kind of the big picture structure here is uh, if KK were true, that would vindicate the, the possibility of having common knowledge because it would give you a way if KK were true, then, then if you know that Alex used to smoke and I know that Alex used to smoke, then we'll both Omega know that. And if we each know that each of us know the same things, then we'll have common knowledge. Because if, for example, if, if I know that I know, and I know that if I know that you know, then I'll know that you know. And then you just do that a million times, a little more than a million. Okay, so that's the big picture structure. All right, so that brings me to the second part of the talk. I'm going to give you a new argument against KK. But to be clear, there are already old arguments against KK. So even if the new argument fails, at least you can see the overall structure of you know why you might be worried about coming here. The new argument about KK is that so we think that KK is is false simply because someone thinks KK is false. That's the new argument. As long as someone thinks KK is false pretty much in a particular way, they think it fails in a particular way, it just is false. And so we think it's very strange that all these people have defended KK as a principle, given they know other people are out there denying it. Because from the fact that people deny it in a certain way, it just immediately follows that it's false. And not only that, but it fails in the sense that, you know, the, the people who deny it don't have omega knowledge. And so if they ever denied it in a conversation, about like, for example, whether Alex used to smoke, then they wouldn't have common ground that Alex used to smoke. So let's get into it. Our denier of KK is doubting is Dudley. And doubting Dudley just has the following properties. Doubting Dudley says 
that he knows he has hands, but he doesn't hundred know that he has hands. And that's the situation. As I said, there are all these philosophers who have argued that um, each iteration of knowledge, oh, and hundred knows means a hundred iterations of knowledge. So there are all these philosophers who have argued that it's very, very difficult to have a hundred iterations of knowledge because that's like requires extremely powerful perceptual abilities that you know we don't have with respect to our hands. So Doubting Dudley has read those things, but he also is not a skeptic. So he thinks uh, he just doesn't think that he hundred knows that he has hands because he thinks basically no one hundred knows anything except like basic mathematical truths and things. And we think, okay, if, if, if Dudley says these things, then KK is false. Uh, and here's like an argument. And I put like a little form formalization below each premise where A means asserts. So, so first of all, we think someone can deny KK while having some knowledge about the world. It's not like the moment you consider whether KK is true and deny it, you, you suddenly don't know anything. So we think Dudley can know hands while asserting that he doesn't hundred know that he has hands. But then here's the key is Dudley only says things that he believes. So since Dudley asserts that he doesn't hundred know he has hands, he believes that he doesn't hundred know that he has hands. And then next we think Dudley never believes things that he knows are false. So since he believes he doesn't hundred know uh, that he has hands, he doesn't know that he hundred knows he has hands. So he doesn't know that he, uh, well, he doesn't know that he, uh, oh, this should have been 101, I guess, but it doesn't matter. All right, so he doesn't know that he hundred knows that he has hands, but that means KK is false because if KK were true, so this, this conclusion here is true, but, but he also knows P, but if KK were true, then I think 100 application or 99, or no, 100 applications of KK would get that he does know that he 100 knows he has hands because he knows that he knows. So he, he knows that he one knows, he knows that he two knows, he knows that he three knows. So he knows that he 100 knows. So KK is false. So that's the argument against KK. And the way we think about it, uh, here's an analogy that we use. Uh, I have a co author, it's not the royal we. Uh, so the analogy we use is um, that Dudley's position with respect to knowledge is the same as like anyone is someone's position could be with respect to love. So it's it, you can you can love people. So Dudley knows that he has hands, but also is, has some has some ignorance about the nature of knowledge. In the same way as Dudley could love someone and have ignorance about what love is. So he doesn't know exactly what love is. Is loving someone a matter of wanting their life to go well? Or do you also have to enjoy spending time with them? This is a toy example. You know, and imagine Dudley has a friend, Boring Boris, who he doesn't like spending time with, but who he wishes the best for. Since Dudley doesn't know what love is, in this case, between these two theories, Dudley doesn't know whether he loves Boris. Uh, and in this respect, knowledge is like love. Dudley is unsure how knowledge works. So Dudley, is Dudley doesn't know that he 100 knows he has hands. But KK says the moment you know something, you immediately know how knowledge works, basically. And we think that's incredible and wrong. All right. So that's the philosophy bit. And then I'm going to end with some reflections. On, so basically, big picture, I don't think KK is true because of that. I think that to have uh, infinite iterations of knowledge would require, you know, uh, things that would be ordinary knowers don't have. And because of that, I don't think that information is public in this sense. I don't think it's ever public in this sense. We, we don't have common knowledge of things. I'm a skeptic about common knowledge. And same with common belief. By the way, the Dudley argument works for belief too, because if, if Dudley thinks that he can believe things without 100 believing them, then the BB principle is wrong. So he can, you know, so I don't think that we have common beliefs either. So I don't think this idea of common ground works. And so then the question is, I just want to close with a sketch of, so then the, the challenge would be, how do we make sense of presupposition and how do we make sense of the felicity conditions for assertion and questions without appealing to common ground? I'm not sure the answer to that question, but I'm just going to close with some suggestive uh, remarks. Uh, and what I would like to be true is, no, really, all these things are just explained by my first order knowledge and the, the speaker's first order knowledge and the hearer's first order knowledge, plus a few iterations, but not too many iterations that just come about not from specific linguistic rules, but just rules for having any rules, just kind of whenever you have any practice like promising or playing chess or whatever that has some rules, there's going to be some secondary rules that govern that as well. And I'll try to sketch what I mean. 
So, you know, like first of all, we said, well, you should only assert something if it's not common ground. Um, if it's already common ground, then you shouldn't assert it. But I think, well, the real rule is just you should only assert something if the, if, if it, well, for, you, should, you should only assert something if the hearer doesn't already know it. Because my goal when I assert something is to, is to make the hearer, give the hearer new information. Yeah. And uh, I'll just go for like one or two extra minutes. I'm almost done now. Uh, and so I think, you know, and then also like, if you just, question when it's common when it's not common ground well the real rule is you should only ask a question if you don't already know the answer and similarly if the if they you know yeah if you, if you already know the answer you you shouldn't ask the question and that's like what's really going on in these cases and then with presupposition what i think is going on is uh you should only uh like assert something uh if you know it and if the hearer is curious whether it's true but then we should use the semantics of presupposition to predict that a hearer can only be curious whether uh, Alex stops smoking if they already know or believe that Alex used to smoke. Yeah, and the speaker can only know that Alex stopped smoking if they already know or believe that uh, Alex used to smoke. So what's going to happen is the semantics of presupposition will get that the speaker and hearer have a first order attitude to the content only if they already know that the presupposition is satisfied. And then that's going to get you a lot of the structure you need of explaining why presupposition seems to have this publicity requirement. But really, it's about the first order state. And then where iterations of knowledge come in is, well, if 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 if, if I'm 99% confident that you don't know that Alex used to smoke, yes, it would be strange to assert that Alex stopped smoking. But that's because the rule governing asserting a presupposition is just don't assert it unless the hearer knows the presupposition is satisfied. But in general, when there's a rule to do something and you're 99% confident you're going to break the rule, then you shouldn't do it. That's a weird thing to do. It's weird to go around having a 99% chance of breaking a rule. Like there's a rule that, here's an analogy, like it's a, it's a rule that you should only, that you keep your promises. You shouldn't make a promise and break it. And that explains why it's strange to promise that you'll win the lottery, even if tomorrow you will win the lottery. Because, okay, well, you wouldn't be breaking the rule but you'd be 99% confident you're breaking the rule. So that's weird to do. And I, what the goal, the general strategy would be explain these cases where it seems like you need all these iterated attitudes as really just, no, no. The, the, the rule of pragma the pragmatic principles here are just about manipulating first order beliefs and knowledge. And then when it seems like higher order knowledge is involved, it's really just like what's happening. The case that motivates that is just going to be a case where you, you, you're, you're too, you have too high a confidence that you're breaking the rules. And when you're confident you're breaking the rules, that's bad. All right. That's the talk. Thank you. Is the question period? Uh, any questions from the floor? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm still a little bit unconvinced about this connection between KK and the common. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but but I mean, would can you kind of make the same argument using, for instance, the problem of logical omissions? You refer to another paper by Stolmaker, but Stolmaker also argues that hey, look, you know, uh, epistemic logic is as they say, yeah, for, I mean, it faces the problem of logical omissions, whereas you know, people do not, people's belief or a belief or yeah, knowledge as they report it or something like that, or as they can use or make available to, I mean, put it to action, do not satisfy this single logic. Therefore, yes. therefore, this sort of a common knowledge that and so on, whose application sort of heavily depends on epistemic logical rules are not actually useful, uh, useless when we are talking about like, you know, as I mean, knowledge as we have it uh, in the form that is available to action and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, so the problem of logical omniscience being like, yeah, like um, these kinds of simple models of communication assume everybody knows like that, you know, like some complex yeah. logical truth. And so what we do in the paper, I don't think I'll successfully do it in the community, but in the paper, what we do is we try to show mm -hmm. that there are a bunch of tools that people have tried to use to mm -hmm. explain away failures of logical omniscience right. um, and then say, okay, in some idealized sense, people are still logically omniscient. Mm -hmm. um, and then we try to show that if you if you take those tools and apply them to KK, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work. 
the same way. So we try to say that there's a disanalogy between logical omniscience and KK. But I totally agree. That's the that's a very natural question to ask. So yeah. for example, like um, you know, like like one kind of tool people use is uh, like diagonalization, mm -hmm. which is saying, well, when people, everyone does know that, uh, you know, 73 plus 55 is whatever it is. <laughs> uh, uh, but the reason people seem like they don't know it is that they don't know that the sentence 73 plus 55 equals blah mm -hmm. expresses a truth. And then one thing that we explore is, well, could you say a similar thing where in the cases where KK seems to fail, it's like Dudley does hundred know that he has hands, but what he doesn't know is that the sentence "I hundred know I have hands" expresses a truth. Okay, yeah. And then so that's the, right. And then what we try to do in the papers, we show that it, when you that there, it's actually much worse to make that for various reasons to make that move in the case of knowledge in the case of KK compared to logical omniscience. That's our that's our burden uh, in the paper. Okay, uh, okay, okay. But still, I don't know. I mean, yeah, still, when it comes to KK, I'm still a little bit, I'm failing to see the relevance here when you are talking about, because that's, I mean, for instance, your your rule, your modified rule involves, um, yeah, right. So for instance, you should assert a P when the hero knows blah, 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 blah. When you, oh dear, I think here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, I mean, I, I'm a little bit skeptical. I mean, okay, a bit, bit of a side issue. Don't, don't you like say that assert p only if you think the hero doesn't know, doesn't already know p. I guess I'm thinking the rule is, don't assert, don't waste the hero's time. That's the rule. Yeah, but then you, if you think you're wasting the hero's time, also you shouldn't. But that's not like the primary rule. That's just like yeah, like whenever there's a rule if you think you're breaking the rule yeah. then you're bad so i'm thinking this is the bedrock rule is don't waste the hero's time you know mm. it's not the only rule but that's okay, the relevant okay okay all right all right all right oh, okay okay that, that's time to the another question oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. uh there's a question from the um room uh, uh could you uh simon uh, could you uh unmute yourself uh, uh hi thanks very much Sure. I remuted it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is it better? Okay. Yeah. okay. So I had a question about the move from saying if you have B not 100K, it follows that not K 100K. So I guess that move assumes that we're talking about something like explicit knowledge. So Dan Greco, I think, in his, in his Philosophy Compass article, uses the distinction between explicit and implicit knowledge in order to defend iteration principles. So I was wondering whether you'd think that the consequence relation would also hold between B not 100K and um, not implicit knowledge. And so whether you think that the kind of case you've presented also refutes or works against theories of KK that are couched in implicit knowledge. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's definitely a promising way to avoid this particular problem. One thing that we try, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you should be. Yeah. Um, one, one thing we try to do in the paper is argue that if you just restrict KK to implicit knowledge, then that will actually undercut many of the existing arguments for the KK principle uh, in the, the, in the literature. I think that this argument that I presented today, um, in terms of its role with common ground, maybe would be survive if it's all implicit knowledge. Um, but there are other arguments that people have given that I think are um, challenged by this. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of an interesting question. Yeah, so does so like does communication like so is all of this reasoning about communication involving iterated knowledge supposed to just be implicit? Uh, would be the relevant question in this case. Maybe that's a way to go. Yeah, uh, yeah, but there are like other arguments. So one argument in favor of KK appeals to these sentences of the form. I'm not going to go into it, but they're called dubious assertions of the form. I have hands and I don't know that I know I have hands and they're supposed to be weird to assert. And that's a reason to accept KK. And we think, for example, that's one argument that really appeals to explicit knowledge, but I don't want to get into the details now. And so that would be one kind of strategy for thinking about the implicit knowledge route is find all the arguments in favor of KK and see how many of them can really just use implicit knowledge. 
let's pick one more question from the Zoom. Uh, Takeshi Yamada, uh, Yamasan, uh, could you give, give us a kind of short question? <laughs> I'm just wondering uh, why why uh, in 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 that case why why we can't say you are begging the question because uh, uh, it says uh, on the start that tree doesn't know KK principle right yes. So I agree Dudley doesn't know the KK principle in the case, but what, what the, the logical structure we found interesting is that uh, the existence of, if Dudley exists as described uh, and knows that he has hands, then it's not just that he doesn't know the KK principle, but that the KK principle is actually false. So that's what we found so interesting is it's kind of like, if people don't know KK in this particular way, then it's not just that they don't know it, then it is false. Or con or contraposing, it's like it's kind of a it's 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 a weakly self intimating principle where if KK is true, then you you can't disbelieve it in these certain ways. Yeah. But uh, that that really only is is not rational. Right? Yeah. Why why you can say that really is rational? But one one principle you could have is that the KK principle holds for rational agents. So you can say if you if you know you have hands and you're rational, then you know you know you have hands, and then you could say Dudley is irrational. But you know, one thing we will say there is that Dudley could be a very you know clever person, so he could satisfy all of the seeming requirements of rationality. He could have read a lot about it. He never makes mistakes in writing down proofs and things, and so it feels a little weird to call him irrational. Um, but yeah, I don't want to take up more time because I'm over time. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.